On December the 18th, 1941, shortly after Nazi Germany's declaration of war against the United States, Admiral Karl Donitz, head of the German U-boat arm, launched Operation Drumbeat, a coordinated submarine assault on the American East Coast. The United States supplied Britain with nearly 90% of its oil, steel, food, and other raw materials, and Donitz hoped that by directly attacking the source of these goods, he could strike the decisive blow against the British Empire. The first wave of five heavy Type 9 U-boats loaded to the gunwales, the gunnels with fuel to torpedoes and provisions took nearly a month to cross the Atlantic. As they approached their stations off the eastern seaboard, apprehension grew among their crews, who assumed that the Americans, drawing on a year and a half of British experience, would have implemented strict defensive measures like ship convoys, anti-submarine patrols, and blackouts of coastal cities. But when they finally surfaced, what they found shocked them. There was barely a navy or coast guard vessel in sight, and at night the lights of cities like New York and Miami blazed as during peacetime silhouette wetting ships plying the coast like ducks in a shooting gallery. As Captain Peter Eric Kramer of the U-333 later wrote, against the photolight glare of a carefree new world were passing the silhouettes of ships recognizable in every detail and shape as the outlines in a sales catalog. Here they were, formally presented to us on a plate. Please help yourselves. Thus began what became known as the Second Happy Time, when the U-boats were free to attack American coastal shipping with near impunity. Over only one month in early 1942, the five U-boats of the first wave sunk an astonishing 23 ships, totaling 151,505 tons, before simply running out of the torpedoes and having to return home. Emboldened by this success, Admiral Donitz launched a second and third wave of German U-boats into the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, targeting tankers near the major oil ports of Galveston, Houston, and New Orleans, and freighters carrying aluminium ore from Aruba and British Guiana. In February 1942, a pack of U-boats even surfaced off Aruba to shell an oil refinery with their deck guns. In 1942 alone, U-boats sank 263 ships in the Caribbean and 56 in the Gulf of Mexico, exceeding even the total sunk in the North Atlantic, the U-boats' traditional hunting ground. Many of these attacks took place so close to shore that tourists on the boardwalks could watch the eerie spectacle of oil tankers bursting into flames and sinking before their eyes. In one instance, citizens of Long Island, unaware of what was happening, called the local police to report a fire. Meanwhile, the US Navy and Coast Guard scrambled to confront the mounting disaster. Though forewarned by British intelligence of the first wave's arrival, Admiral Ernest J. King, commander-in-chief of the United States fleet, had stubbornly refused to implement the time-tested convoy system, believing that ships were safer sailing on their own. Not that he had the ships to implement such a system. Interwar naval construction had prioritized battleships and aircraft carriers over convoy escorts and anti-submarine vessels leaving the Navy to counter the U-boat menace with only seven Coast Guard cutters, four converted yachts, two 40-year-old gunboats, and seven World War I-era submarine chasers. Even the simplest of defensive measures, blackouts of all coastal cities, proved difficult as the mayors of those cities refused on the grounds that it would hurt tourism. Against such thin and disorganized defenses, the U-boat attacks carried on unabated. Then in March of 1942, Alfred Stanford, Commodore of the Cruising Club of America, proposed a unique solution. Stanford offered to the Navy's eastern sea frontier, command of the use of 30 auxiliary sailing yachts, complete with skippers and crews, to act as a stopgap anti-submarine patrol fleet. Although by April this offer had grown to 70 yachts and 100 smaller vessels, the Navy initially refused. It was not until May the 4th, when the U-boat situation had grown truly desperate, that Admiral King finally relented and authorized the Coast Guard Reserve to form the Coastal Picket Patrol, the United States' first civilian naval militia since the War of 1812. The Picket Patrol allowed any man otherwise ineligible for naval service due to age or health to serve for a limited tour of 30 days. The fleet, which at its height numbered some 8,000 men and 3,000 small vessels, was divided into five task groups based along the eastern seaboard. Each vessel assigned a 15 nautical mile square to patrol. Attracting all kinds of misfits and adventurers, from weekend pleasure boaters to rum runners and boy scouts, the Picket Patrol soon became known as the Corsair Fleet and the Hooligan Navy. And among their ranks was none other than legendary author and paragon of manliness, Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was no stranger to war and adventure, believing that the purest truth in literature could only come from personal experience, and from an early age, Hemingway had set out to live the most authentic and dangerous life possible. During the First World War, he served as an ambulance driver on the Italian front, where he was wounded by shrapnel and received an Italian medal for bravery. He later served as a war correspondent during the Spanish Civil War, took up bullfighting as a hobby, and went on numerous big-game safaris in Africa. In every case, his experiences provided valuable grit 
wrist for his literary mill, directly inspiring such celebrated works as A Farewell to Arms, for whom the bell tolls death in the afternoon, and The Snows of Kilimanjaro. In the late 1920s, Hemingway moved to Key West, Florida, and gravitated towards yet another manly hobby, big game fishing. Never one to do things by half measures, in 1934, Hemingway ordered a custom fishing boat from Wheeler Shipbuilding in Brooklyn, which he named Pillar. This was a reference to both the bullfighting shrine Our Lady of the Pillar in Zaragoza, Spain, and Hemingway's second wife, Pauline Fairfer, who used it as a code name in letters while Hemingway was still married to his first wife, Hadley Richardson. Hemingway would also give the name to the female rebel leader in his 1940 novel For Whom the Bell Tolls. Measuring 38 feet long, Pillar was fitted with a live well for storing fish, a lowered transom with a roller for hauling fish aboard, a flying bridge and twin 70 horsepower engines, giving her a top speed of 16 knots and a range of 500 miles. She was among the first purpose-built big game sport fishing boats anywhere in the world. Aboard Pillar, Hemingway made numerous fishing voyages around Key West, Bimini, and the Marquesas. These were raucous, rum-fueled affairs that very often showcased Hemingway's legendary pugnaciousness. On one occasion, Hemingway offered a prize of $200 to any Bahamian who could go three rounds with him in a boxing Ring, while in another, he punched out wealthy newspaper publisher Joe Knapp in a dockside brawl. According to Hemingway biographer Jeffrey Mars, on these voyages, Pillar became a kind of floating whorehouse and rum factory, as well as a fishing boat. Despite all this, Hemingway became a pioneer in big game fishing and was instrumental in establishing the sport in North America. Among his innovations was a new technique for landing tuna. The traditional method was to keep the fish on the line for as long as possible in order to tire it out. However, this tended to attract sharks, which left the fish half-eaten or apple cored by the time it was landed. Hemingway's technique was to reel the fish in quickly before the sharks could get to it, and in this manner he became the first person to land a tuna in pristine condition. Some of Hemingway's other innovations, however, were less than successful. On one occasion, while attempting to finish off a shark he had reeled in, Hemingway ended up shooting himself through both legs with his pistol. On another, while his friend Henry Strater was reeling in a 1,000-pound marlin, Hemingway attempted to fend off the circling sharks with a Thompson submachine gun. The effect of this was merely to fill the water with blood and attract even more sharks, which ate away nearly half the fish before it was landed. Such occupational hiccups aside, however, Hemingway absolutely dominated the sport, winning every fishing tournament in the Key West Havana Bamimi Triangle in 1935 and landing a record seven marlin in a single day in 1938. He wrote numerous articles on big game fishing for American magazines, founded the Bahamas Marlin and Fishing Club, and even hosted ichthyologist Henry Fowler for the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences on an expedition to classify marlin species. Fowler would later name a species of scorpion fish after Hemingway. All these experiences would form the basis for Hemingway's 1951 Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning novel, the Old Man in the Sea. In 1939, Hemingway and his third wife, Martha Gellhorn, whom he had met while they were correspondents in Spain, moved into a 15-acre property called Finca Vigia outside of Havana, Cuba. When Nazi Germany declared war on the United States on December 11, 1941, Hemingway was eager to join the war effort and offered his services to the American ambassador in Havana, Spruill Braden. At the time, it was suspected that Cubans loyal to the fascist regime of Spanish dictator Francisco Franco might provide assistance to the German agents and U-boats operating operating in the Caribbean. Thus, with the ambassador's blessing, Hemingway pulled together a team of friends and acquaintances into an ad hoc counterintelligence unit he dubbed the Crook Factory with the mission of rooting out this fifth column. But while Braden was impressed with Hemingway's work, declaring he built up an excellent organization and he did an A1 job, Martha Gellhorn, who was by this time falling out of love with Hemingway, dismissed the Crook Factory as little more than a drinking club. In any case, the group's work, which mostly consisted of observing suspected collaborators and writing lengthy reports soon began to bore Hemingway, and he longed for a more active, heroic means of contributing to the war effort. With the formation of the Hooligan Navy in May 1942, he finally got his chance. Hemingway once again approached Ambassador Braden and requested radio equipment, heavy machine guns, and depth charges to turn his fishing boat Pillar into an armed submarine chaser. Hemingway was inspired by the Q-ships of the First World War, merchant vessels with hidden guns used to ambush U-boats attacking on the surface. The fact that U-boats were known to surface beside small fishing boats and confiscate their catches, added a veneer of plausibility to the scheme, and Braden agreed to Hemingway's request, providing him with $32,000 in high-frequency direction finding or huffed-off radio equipment and a U.S. Marine Sergeant, Don Saxon, to operate it. Pillar's wooden structure proved too fragile to mount heavy machine guns, so Hemingway had to make do with his Thompson submachine gun, a handful of rifles and pistols, and a box of hand grenades. Some sources claim Hemingway also got his hands on a bazooka. As for just how he planned to take out a U-boat with this 
tiny arsenal. Hemingway was somewhat vague, though it appears his basic strategy was to wait until the submarine drew near, rake the deck with rifles and machine guns, and drop grenades down the conning tower hatch. Hemingway even constructed a heavy coffin-like scuttling charge that could be dropped down the hatch to sink the boat. Unsurprisingly, this decidedly harebrained scheme attracted considerable skepticism, with the Chief of Naval Intelligence for Central America, Colonel John W. Thomason, declaring that no U-boat commander would be stupid enough to come that close. Furthermore, he argued even the speedy pillar could never keep up with a surfaced U-boat, which was capable of speeds up to 18 knots. Hemingway dismissed him out of hand as a doubting Thomason. Dubbing the venture Operation Friendless after one of his beloved cats, Hemingway spent the next 18 months making hundreds of patrols into the Florida Straits, through which U-boats had to pass to enter the Gulf of Mexico. In addition to Sergeant Saxon, he was accompanied on these voyages by a rotating roster of local sailors, friends, and acquaintances, including his two teenage sons, Patrick and Gregory. Operating from base camp on kayak on feeds, Hemingway plied the small islands and keys between Florida and Cuba, searching not only for U-boats, but also caches of fuel, food, and water left by local collaborators. For month after month, they found nothing, a result that should have surprised no one. U-boats tended to stay submerged during the day, only surfacing at night to recharge their batteries, and Pillard lacked the sonar, radar, or navigational instruments required for night hunting. Listening to radio chatter also proved futile, as nobody aboard spoke German, and the U-boat transmissions were all encrypted. Unsurprisingly, while Hemingway took his patrols very seriously, Martha Gellhorn dismissed the whole endeavor as a lark, an excuse for Hemingway to sail around around fish and get drunk with his friends while pretending to contribute to the war effort. She also accused Hemingway of using the patrols to access normally rationed naval stores of fuel and alcohol or get out of a Cuban drunk driving charge. She may not have been entirely wrong, for like Hemingway's earlier fishing cruises, his submarine patrols were thoroughly booze-soaked affairs. Sergeant Saxon reportedly drank 20 glasses of gin per day, while Hemingway described having to go a week without gin as a major wartime hardship. An attempt by Hemingway to limit his crew's consumption to just two drinks per day nearly resulted in mutiny, forcing Hemingway to back down. Yet on at least two occasions, Hemingway and company came tantalizingly close to intercepting their quarry. In December 1942, they spotted a Spanish freighter, the Marc de Comillas, being trailed by what looked like a U-boat. Hemingway radioed in the sighting to the Cuban authorities, who boarded and inspected the freighter when it arrived in Havana. However, nothing suspicious was found, and no one aboard admitted to seeing a submarine. Later, Hemingway's son Gregory spotted a U-boat at a distance of a thousand yards. The pillar immediately gave chase, but the U-boat dove and slipped away. While at first the Cuban authorities dismissed the sighting, later that day, the same U-boat was captured by a Coast Guard vessel while landing four agents near New Orleans. But by July 1943, the U-boat war in the Caribbean was drawing to a close, and Pillar received a coded message ordering her home. While Hemingway would take the boat on a few more short patrols, his days as a submarine chaser were effectively over. Restless and hungry for adventure, Hemingway left for Europe as a war correspondent, landing in France in June 1944, shortly after D-Day. Hemingway's contemporaries were divided as to the practicality of his U-boat patrols, with Captain Mario Remy as the only Cuban to actually capture a U-boat, dismissing the author as a playboy who hunted submarines off the Cuban coast as a whim. However, his escapades were not entirely fruitless, for they formed the basis of his novel Islands in the Steam. The novel, which chronicles the life of Thomas Hudson, an artist living in Bimini who hunts U-boats during the Second World War, was published posthumously following Hemingway's suicide in 1961. Meanwhile, the 8,000-strong hooligan navy proved little more effective than Hemingway, with few picket boats managing to spot, let alone engage a U-boat. On September 15, 1943, the yacht Edu 2 spotted a U-boat at a range of 100 yards and attacked with machine guns. The U-boat's captain, unsure of his attacker's full armament, proceeded to crash, dive, and slip away. But most German captains weren't so easily intimidated. On one occasion, the crew of a cabin cruiser patrolling off the coast of Florida were startled by the sight of a U-boat conning tower rising out of the sea right beside them. To their astonishment, the submarine's captain proceeded to come out on deck and call to them in perfect English, Get the hell out of here, you guys. Do you want to get hurt? Now scram. The introduction of convoys, blackouts, and fast purpose-built patrol vessels soon made the tiny civilian boats redundant, and on October 1, 1943, the picket patrol was disbanded. While they may not have accomplished much in the grand scheme of things, the hooligan navy was emblematic of the communitarian fighting spirit that defined the Second World War, when anything and anyone that could make him the slightest contribution to victory was eagerly pressed into service. For as Hemingway himself declared at the outbreak of war, we are going to have Christ's own bitter time to win it, if, when, and ever. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and as always, thank you for watching.